Oh, it's you! We were raising your Pokémon, and my goodness, we were surprised! This odd egg appeared randomly in front of your Pokémon. We don't really know how it got there, but... do you want it? Um, wow, that's weird. Okay, yeah, I'll take it, sure. Oh, wait, it, it's hatching! What's this? Ew, it's purple! Ugh, d yeah. Oh, thank god, I think that monkey was infected with something! Good thing I released it, that thing would have been uh, dangerous to a society! Oh, man, Keep I'm calm, Julian. Keep so calm. Scary. No, man. Are you okay? Man, that scared the crap out of me, man. What is going on, guys? This is Dobbs here, bringing you another Pokemon video. And in this video, we're going to go over 15 unsolved mysteries in Pokemon. But before we start, I just want to let you guys know that I have a brand new t-shirt up on my merch store. It features 8 Pokemon content creators and it's just so freaking cool and it looks awesome. And it was made for the upcoming event Show Your Moves 2020 that will be hosted on the Dobbs channel in February. So if you want to buy yourself your own Show Your Moves t-shirt, check out the link down below in the description under merch. And yeah, with that said, without further ado, let's get started. Now, ever since Pokemon Red and Blue, we have been capturing Pokemon with Pokeballs that we just buy from the mart. It's been a luxury that we're just kind of placed into without thinking twice about. But, you have to ask, how on earth did trainers catch Pokemon before Professor Westwood created the modern Pokeball? Because with this game-changing invention, it turned Pokemon into a little red aura of, of energy. I don't even know what the Pokeball turns them into, it's like virtual data of some sort. And well, in Gen 2, it touches on that subject for like a split second. You see, according to some random person in the Azalea Town Pokemon Center, it's kind of weird that you learn about this awesome history from some random person that's sitting there. Before Pokeballs were invented, hollowed out Apricorns were used to capture Pokemon. And if you play the Pokemon games or watch the anime, these Apricorns are like berries, but with very hard shells. So basically, Pokeball creators like Kurt would hollow out these berries and use the hard shell to create a Pokeball. But that's where my confusion starts, because how did Pokemon fit inside these hollowed out shells? Because wasn't the whole purpose of the modern Pokeball was to shrink Pokemon into red matter and fit them inside there? I'm just very confused on how Apricorns work, and I'm baffled they skipped over this important detail. I mean, I feel like it's very important to know how they're going to fit a Rhydon into a tiny little berry shell. I just don't know. Now we all know the Pokemon anime has this moments where it doesn't really stay true to the video games. Because you have moments like Pikachu and Swellow using Thunder Armor to attack a Lunatone and Soul Rock. Yeah, what was Ash even thinking? Like, that makes no sense. But surprisingly, that is not the mystery of this video. The mystery resides in the first season of the Pokemon anime. And it has something to do with Gary in this picture. Do you see it? Yeah, for some reason he has 10 gym badges, and most of them are not even identifiable. In fact, I only recognize 4 of them, which are the Boulder, Rainbow, Cascade, and Volcano badges. And for the other 6, I, I just have no idea. So, either Gary counterfeit his gym badges to show off to Ash to make him jealous, or there are more than 8 gyms in the Kanto region. It remains a mystery. Now, it's a known fact that pretty much every Pokemon player hated HMs, because giving up a move for navigation was just... not fun. And even though I hate HMs very much, there's one that looked pretty exciting back in the Gen 1 games, but too bad it was scrapped though. Because apparently in the coding, there's an unused HM that lies between HMO2 and HMO3, basically making it the true HMO3. And when the player used this HM, the game would say, ground rose up somewhere. What? Where did the ground rise up? What does this mean? And why does it sound so cool? Is a Pokemon using Psychic and, and the player is lifting up a rock to go under it? It sounds super cool and exciting and I'm, I'm pretty bummed out that they scrapped this because it sounds awesome. So I guess for now until a Game Freak developer explains what this HM was supposed to do, it will remain a mystery. Which is too bad. Now Pokemon X and Y were alright games mainly due to the fact that they introduced Mega Evolution. And if you recall from the lore, Mega Stones were originally evolutionary stones that were transformed by the power of Xerneas and Evoltal. And apparently this transformation happened thousands and thousands of years ago when Xerneas and Evoltal were flying the skies or whatever they do. Although I don't know how Xerneas would fly the sky, I guess he was just chilling in the forest or something. But anyways, what remains a mystery to me is the fact that Mewtwo has a Mega Stone. And not just one Mega Stone, but he has two Mega Stones. And I'm questioning on how Mewtwo just has one of them, because wasn't Mewtwo born like 20 years ago? Are you telling me there was a Mega Stone that was just recently developed for Mewtwo? 
I feel like that would have been a major plot device in X and Y, because Team Rocket would definitely would have been behind that. But no, you just find Mewtwo randomly in a cave and some stones by him. And I don't think Mew's DNA has anything to do with these stones, because it's called Mewtwo and Knight, not Mew Knight. It's just very confusing, and I feel like this is a plot hole. Now back in the day, there used to be a typing that was used for basically just one move, which was the triple question mark typing. And as you probably know, it was used for the curse move, which would raise the stats of a non-ghost type Pokemon. And of course, it would work differently for ghost types. And up until Gen 5, when curse became a ghost type move, the triple question mark typing was pretty mysterious. And in Gen 4, it became even more mysterious, because Arceus was programmed to have a triple question mark typing. Because as you can see in this data mine sprite, Arceus has like a bluish greenish coloring to his body with pink trim. And I'm wondering what this was supposed to be. My theory is Game Freak was going to give him like the divine typing where no mortal can know what really typing it is. And this unknown typing is Arcus's natural typing. It's so godly that we can't comprehend it. And what would have been a cool way to unlock this typing would be to get all the plates and just combine them into a question mark. It could have been a cool feature for Arceus. But I guess for now, unfortunately, this data mine sprite remains an unsolved mystery. Throughout the history of Pokemon, there has been pretty weird breeding pairs, like Waylord and Skitty. Like, how is it supposed to do the, the thing and, and make eggs? I don't even know. However, surprisingly enough, there is something even more stranger than this when it comes to breeding, which is the Undiscovered Egg Group. Specifically, Nidoqueen and Nidorina. The only two non-legendary, non-baby, and non-special Pikachu cosplay. Like, why is that even there? Like, that's pretty obvious. Pokemon that can't breed with other Pokemon. And what makes this even stranger is the fact that Nidoran female can breed with Nidoking while Nidorina and Nidoqueen can't. Like, what makes these two Pokemon so mysterious when it comes to breeding? Nidoqueen even has a Pokedex entry from Ruby and Sapphire where it talks about defending its young. So it is proven to at least have offspring, but it can't breed with Nidokings. So is the whole population dependent on Nidoran females to breed with a Nidoking? It's just a very strange situation, and I'm dying to know why Game Freak made it like this. It's just so random. Now the move Surf is a very strange HM because there are a lot of weird Pokemon that can learn it for some reason. And in Gen 1, there were some pretty weird cases, like for example, Rhydon can learn Surf because... why? They even made a Pokemon anime episode based on a unique Rhydon that can learn Surf because it was so weird and strange. There was a girl named Pietra who made it her mission to catch this surfing Rhydon because it was just so cool to her. And you know, Rhino was the first Pokemon ever made, so, you know, I give it a pass. But there are more Pokemon that are just very strange when it comes to Surf. Like, for instance, Tauros. It, what? I couldn't even picture a Tauros surfing, let alone swimming. How in the heck would it support his body weight and those hooves? Like, how does that go through water? But the weirdness doesn't stop there. There are Pokemon like Snorlax, Tyranitar, Agron, and Zigzagoon. Yes, Zigzagoon, the Route 1 Pokemon you catch in Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire, can learn Surf. It is like the perfect HM slave to get early on. And fun fact, Junichi Masuda revealed in an interview that Surf is his favorite move. So maybe these Pokemon can learn Surf just because he loves the move Surf. Which wouldn't surprise me because if I was a developer, I would do the same thing. I, I would allow Magikarp to learn Judgment because it would just be hilarious. But other than that theory, it remains a mystery. Now, as you know, in Generation 2, shiny Pokemon were introduced as altered color Pokemon. And if you played Pokemon Gold and Silver, you'd know that the radio tower signal that Team Rocket emitted caused these Pokemon to mutate. But this is where the unsolved mystery begins. Because if you didn't know, these radio signals caused a normal Magikarp to forcefully evolve into a Gyarados that retained its red coloring, which therefore is why the red Gyarados is red. But if that's the real reason why the red Gyarados is red, is, is it even a shiny Pokemon at that point? Because if shiny Pokemon were built on the basis that a pre-evolution was forcefully evolved into their foul form, wouldn't they all carry over their pre-evolution's prominent coloring through their forced evolution? Like, let's take Psyduck for instance. If Psyduck was forcefully evolved by the radio tower signal, wouldn't a shiny Golduck be prominently yellow? Because that's the logic that shiny Gyarados follows, so why are all Pokemon like that? And at that point, would pre-evolution shiny Pokemon even exist? It's a strange mystery, especially since the Red Gyarados is the only canon shiny Pokemon to the video games. Unless you count the odd egg Pokemon or the shinies that Binga give you. But it really messes with your mind when you think about it. 
Now, in Pokemon X and Y, the giant 9-foot character AZ had a Floetta, and it was all because of this Floetta that he fired a giant cannon that destroyed thousands of Pokemon, because he wanted to resurrect his dear friend that lost his life during the Kalos War. And since AZ's Floetta was such a big part of X and Y's storyline, Game Freak decided to program it to the game as a future mystery gift Pokemon. But the thing is, it was, it was never released, and no one has any idea on why. What's even stranger is the fact that this Eternal Flower Floetta has the move Light of Ruin, which is literally the best fairy type move in the game, but it was never released, so it's an unreleased move. So it's just very confusing on why Game Freak never released this Pokemon. And I can't even believe this, but it's almost been 7 years since Pokemon X and Y was released, so it's been up in the air for quite a while now. But there is a theory with Pokemon Sword and Shield how Eternatus might be related to the Eternal Flower, and that the Kalos War was actually with the Galar region. Which would make sense because of the Anglo-French War with the British and the French. But anyways, for now, it's an unsolved mystery, and I guess it's Floetta will remain an unreleased Pokemon. Which is too bad. Now, Voltorb is... a mystery. Like, what even is this Pokemon? It has countless Pokedex entries that state that it was first sighted by a manufacturer who creates Pokeballs. And even more that state that it was first discovered when Pokeballs were invented. Well, at least the Silph Company ones. So, what on earth is it with Voltorb and Electrode? It's, it's pretty obvious they're living Pokeballs, but why? And basically what I've already said is what is known for these Pokemon. They're, they're super mysterious. And no, I don't think a Haunter possess a Pokeball. I, I feel like there's more to it than that. Let me know in the comments on what you think, it's, it's just a mystery. Now, going back to Generation 2 yet again, yes, these are my favorite games, so I love talking about them. Something that has always remained a mystery to me were the three Pokemon that Ho-Oh revived in the Burnt Tower. Because we know when Ho-Oh revived these Pokemon, he blessed them with legendary power that represented their death. Which was Raikou being the Thunderbolt, Inten being the Fire, and Suicune being the Rain. But, my question is, what were these Pokemon before they were revived by Ho and became the legendary beasts we all know and love today? One theory that you probably heard is that the three bees were originally the three EV evolutions. Because for one, in Necrotique City, the Kimono Girls are like down the street from the Burnt Tower who all have EV evolutions. And for two, which is the most convincing part, all of the legendary bees hidden abilities are the same as the base ability for the EV evolutions. Vaporeon has Water Absorb, Suicune has a hidden ability Water Absorb, Jolteon has Volt Absorb, Raikou has a hidden ability Volt Absorb, and Flareon has Flash Fire, while Entei has a hidden ability Flash Fire. Coincidence? I think not. But what kind of debunks this theory are the silhouettes you see in Pokemon Origins, because they're clearly not EV Evolution silhouettes. But that's just an interpretation, so it might not be fully true. So I guess it just remains a mystery, but I would love to know. Now, I want to ask this plain and simply, what are rare candies and where do they come from, and why are they rare? They've been a part of the Pokemon game since Generation 1, but there hasn't been any explanation on where they come from. What's even stranger is the fact that in an interview with Junichi Masuda, he mentions that humans can consume rare candies, but it'll be the equivalent of eating dog food. But hey, I would eat dog food if it made me stronger. Like, if I could level up to 100 just by eating dog food, like, t count me in. I've even heard a theory that Pokemon Go is set back before Pokemon Red and Blue, and the candies you give your Pokemon become rare candies in later games. But to me, that theory is not that compelling, because there are rare candies in Pokemon Go as well. So the whole thing is just a mystery, but at least I found out that I would eat dog food to become stronger. Which, I guess, isn't a mystery anymore, apparently. Now, if there was one thing that was a mystery to the Pokemon anime, it wouldn't be Ash's aging, it would be the GS Ball. Because the GS Ball was so hyped up to be opened by Professor Ivy, and even Professor Oak, but then it was later forgotten about because Ash had to go to the Pokemon League, and then it was just forgotten about forever. And what's even more mysterious is Professor Ivy herself, because how does she even obtain this GS Ball? What the heck happened with her and Brock, and why does Brock always get really upset and frightened when you mention Professor Ivy's name? It just seems that everything that has to do with the GS Ball has a mystery behind it. And it just sucks, because they made a huge emphasis on opening this ball by going to a bunch of people, and then they just leave it with Kurt and just say, okay, see you later, and that's the end of the GS Ball. And until they bring it back and reveal what's inside of it, and who made it, and why is it so important, it will just remain a mystery in the Pokemon anime, which is very unfortunate.
And finally, the Berserk Gene. The Berserk Gene is mysterious for one simple reason. And that reason is, this item was originally supposed to be held by a Mewtwo in Pokemon Gold and Silver. But the thing is, there, there's no Mewtwo. And so you just find this item randomly as an invisible item in Cerulean City. So, with that said, was Mewtwo supposed to be in Pokemon Gold and Silver? The world may never know, but in all likelihood, it probably was. And probably was crap due to time constraints. But still, it is a mystery. And there you go, 15 unsolved mysteries in Pokemon. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like if you did because I appreciate it a ton. Also, if you want to see more videos like this, be sure to subscribe because I upload pretty frequently now being a full time YouTuber and all. And don't forget to ring that bell because that notifies you even more. And if you want to be even more awesome, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, or even join my Discord server because all those platforms are super cool. And also, I live stream every other day on my Dobbs gaming channel, so you should definitely check it out. We've been doing a lot of shiny hunting and Pokemon raids, so it's definitely a lot of fun. You can check down below for my gaming channel link and the merch store that I mentioned in the beginning of this video. And finally, for the question of this video, what are your answers to these unsolved mysteries? Be sure to let me know down below in the comments because I'm going to read those comments and reply to them and be like, Whoa, that's crazy. And yeah, that's all for this video and I will see you guys next time. See ya.